But let me first uh, thank uh, Jean-Paul, Louis, Lunarens, and uh, Sig Pislu, with, of course, all the work being done behind the scenes by uh, Joanna. Uh, let me thank all the people who were responsible for this uh, little conference. For me, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I've, I've learned um, quite a lot about uh, how people are thinking of uh, symmetry. I, I should tell you, my early uh, days were spent in theoretical physics, and uh, so I'm very familiar with the role of uh, especially Lie groups in, in physical theory. I've been very skeptical over the years. I, I would love to apply that machinery in uh, cognitive science, but I remain somewhat skeptical. I think the no that there are ideas that have come through over, uh, from yesterday and, and earlier today that uh, will get me to uh, rethink some of my prejudices. Anyway, today, I want to talk about a field that has been worked over for years and several very famous books um, that have guided the field that is called uh, signal detection. This terminology is, is a, a historical hangover, um, but one task that is, in one form or another, fairly familiar to everyone, I think, uh, involves um, recognition, uh, recall, and, and recognition memory, where an observer, we can't use the word subject anymore for politically correct reasons. I think that's uh, ill-advised, but okay. So a person who volunteers, say, to take part in a memory experiment may be given a list of words. Those words may have been very carefully constructed, uh, but that's not really the point. The, uh, the, the subject, the observer, um, doesn't need to know that and is simply asked to study a collection of words presented either sequentially in time or all together in a list. After some study period, at some uh, point following study, uh, a word is introduced to the subject, and the subject's task is simply to respond with one or two responses, old or new. I've seen this word before, it was on the list that I studied, or it isn't. This is a simple example using actually very complicated stimuli. Uh, words are not, are not trivial to describe. This is a very simple example of a so-called yes-no detection experiment. And let me talk about, in fact, three experimental procedures, paradigms, that are related in a fairly obvious way, one to another. In a second kind of uh, experiment, you can imagine after studying a list of words, a subject is presented with a pair of words, one of which is guaranteed to be one that was studied, one of which is new, non-studied. And the subject has to indicate which one was studied. This is a two-interval, forced choice task. 
And finally, there is a ranking task that is not very common. I think it's a, a, a brilliant task if you can overcome uh, some experimental difficulties. Let's suppose you expand the two interval or the two alternative task and you have one word that was studied embedded in a list of a whole bunch of words that were not studied. And, the, and these are displayed either sequentially or all together and the subject's task is to pick out that word that was studied. This is the uh, so-called K plus one alternative paradigm, but within that same paradigm, you can also ask for the subject to give a ranking of each word in this uh, collection. And so you are interested in the rank that is uh, given to the, to the studied word. And you can study those rankings. What the, the, the main conclusion of my research on this is that all three paradigms looked at in the right way with the right data collected are equivalent in the sense that the general alternative false choice experiment gives data that from which you can recover the ranking data, whether or not that ranking uh, task was ever even introduced uh, as, as a problem for the subject to solve. Vice versa, the ranking task gives data from which you can extract whether or not the experiment was actually carried out. You can extra extract the uh, false choice data and this might be a bit surprising, the, each of those equivalent sets of data allow you to construct the so-called receiver operating characteristic that is underlying performance in the yes-no task. So let's make sure, so that, that's essentially the uh, conclusion of this uh, talk. Let's look uh, briefly at the yes-no task. <coughs> there are two <coughs> kinds of stimuli, old and new, or in this old-fashioned uh, generic uh, terminology, signal and noise. Signal detection had its origins in psychology, mainly in a psychophysical context. And there are things like tones or tone complexes that can be identified with uh, uh, real signals, signals that are uh, occurring in time. And uh, the notion of noise is well understood both in audition and vision. The responses, again, are of two categories, and I've just labeled them here, again, signal and noise. And there are four stimulus response uh, categories. These in a medical context, and signal detection is used all the time in uh, especially um, performance uh, in radiology and other, uh, other contexts in, in medical research. And you might be more familiar with that terminology, which is true positive, uh, false positive, true negative, false negative. But anyway, we use the terms hit, false alarm, miss, and correct rejection. Over multiple trials, the probability that a subject makes uh, a hit uh, versus 
uh, amiss. Those probabilities are complementary. They add to one, so there's a constraint, and likewise here. The tradition in the field, which comes from uh, statistical, classical statistical decision theory, is to study the trade-off between hits and false alarms. And that trade-off is a function called a receiver operating characteristic. Here's a, a small-scale typical experiment where from one block of trials to another to another, one varies the probability of signal. So up here, you get data. You get a hit rate and a false alarm rate under a condition in which the subject knows that the, uh, the probability of a signal on any one trial is fairly large. And this is for another block of trials in, in which the same stimuli are used, but the probability of signal is uh, a little less, and so on. For this last case, probability of signal is quite small. So the subject might give you those three points, and the underlying theory tells you that those points, you can connect the dots, and there is a function that interpolates the data, and that function is called an operating ROC, operating characteristic. So take away the data, and in dealing with yes, the yes-no paradigm, we are interested in functions like the one in blue. Now, these are cartoons. I just drew them freehand, and the, the, the shape of this, this uh, piecewise linear function that uh, don't read anything into that. Very often, especially with parametric theories, these are curves. Here's just the sort of notation that I use at standard. We're going to be talking about random variables, and they're represented by uppercase uh, Latin letters. Probability in this talk is just written out as prob, and I'll be talking about cumulative distribution functions, which are written in a standard way. The first result, which is actually very easy to obtain, is that every ROC at least ROCs within a fairly large class. They are in strictly increasing continuous functions of the unit interval onto itself. They are homeomorphisms of 0, 1. We say that there is a representation of an ROC in terms of random variables, indexed two random variables, one indexed by signal, one indexed by noise. This is in complete agreement with underlying uh, statistical decision making, in which you can think of these random variables, say, as likelihood ratios or log likelihood. Log likelihood. And the question is, it would be nice to use the data to extract information about those underlying decision random variables. And the first result is, you can always do this. <laughs> 
there is a representation of an ROC in terms of random variables with a common range that is the unit interval itself, 0, 1. All you have to do is to take the noise random variable as uniform. Nothing prevents this interpretation. And then the signal random variable, its distribution function, is determined by the ROC explicitly. And you can say, well, in the models that I'm used to using, based, say, on the assumption that the underlying evidence is normally distributed, a very common assumption, I don't have any feel for that representation. And the, the answer is, but your picture can always be transformed into this one, always. So I'm going to be uh, using a representation for the most part, not always, in which the evidence random variables take values in 0, 1. Now, years ago, George Sperling, not here, he was here yesterday. George once mentioned to me, sort of offhand, when we were talking about uh, signal detection, George complained that it seems unnatural to plot, as you do, to generate an ROC. Good performance hits against poor performance, errors, false alarm. Why not good performance against good or even poor against poor? Why? why? Well, in fact, there are four functions that you can plot. Two of them deserve uh, equal credit as being ROCs, and they're labeled here as rho, the usual ROC, and rho asterisk, or rho star, which is introduced uh, by me as a very useful object. It, too, is an increasing uh, one-to-one -one onto function in the unit square. And then the others are the functions that George would like. One is plotting poor performance against poor, and the other is plotting good performance against good. And they are, I don't have a, a particular name for them. I call them R plus and minus. Um, and we're going to uh, see how these four functions speak to one another because it doesn't matter which function you focus on. You can generate, you can recover the other three. Here is the geometry that relates the ROC rho in blue to the dual rho star. Rho star, given an ROC rho, you generate rho star by reflection about the off diagonal, the, this guy. And you can see that the orange curve is indeed the reflection of rho. And just for future reference, notice, and that's easy if you just rotate everything by 45 degrees, the area subtended by rho is the same as the area subtended by rho star. 
Why is it a rectangle rather than a square? Why is it a rect? Which rectangle? I, you're, you're criticizing my freehand drawing, perhaps? <laughs> no, well, you know, you have, you have you know, probability of, you know, I was expecting to see a square. That's all. Yeah. And if you have a square, if you have a square, then, then it's symmetrical. Yeah. Like I say, I, I apologize for my, my crude sketches, but yeah, it's meant to be a square. I mean, you're, I think I've fed into the horizontal vertical illusion big time. Yeah. Okay, uh, and there's, here, here's the analytic connection. What's interesting about that, which doesn't look very user-friendly at all, is to notice that the, this is, the construction of rho star involves a composition of reflections. You start off with a function. Rho. The inverse is the reflection about the main diagonal, x equals y. And on each side of that reflection, there is a reflection in the mapping. is a reflection. And it's a reflection either in a mirror at the point a half on the x-axis or on the y-axis. One minus a function is a reflection in this axis. The 1 minus t is a reflection in the vertical axis. And as I said, inverse is a reflection about the leading diagonal. OK. So reflections turn out to be very important, this symmetry operations. A very common parametric model involves a distribution for signal and noise that are uh, related simply by a shift by a change of location. And those ROCs have long been called symmetric for a good reason. They are such that the dual ROC and the ROC itself are one and the same function. And those guys are symmetric they are invariant under reflection in the off diagonal. If you have a symmetric ROC, then those other functions that I briefly mentioned, R plus and R minus, turn out to be involutions. And all that means is, in each case, they are their own inverse. So they, they behave under composition. So R plus composed with itself is just the identity, and same with uh, R minus. And when the ROC 
is symmetric. Our plus is the dual to our minus, and each of them is an involution. That turned out to be very useful. In fact, for symmetric ROCs, we, we, there is a more transparent representation. And that's uh, written as a theorem in red. A symmetric ROC always possesses a representation in terms of random variables for which signal and noise components, their distributions, are related via a minus sign. So we throw away this original representation where both random variables had uh, a range of 0, 1, and now we pick a different representation on an interval symmetric about zero, so plus values and minus values occur, and the signal random variable in that representation is, gives you the noise representation with a, a minus sign. And if you prefer to think of densities, derivatives of uh, distribution functions, then this is again a schematic. The signal density and the noise density are related, they are identical except for a reflection. Now let me talk briefly about the uh, general force choice task. There are two tasks. One involves one copy of signal, one old word buried in a collection of k uh, new words, and the subject's task is to pick the odd man out, indicate s. And there's a dual task in which you have a whole bunch of uh, study, already studied words, their signals, with one that is uh, the old man out and uh, unstudied. And the subject's task is to pick that guy. The, okay, the data are collected as probability correct in each case. There is a famous connection between yes-no data and two-interval false choice data. And that was first, uh, that first appeared in work by Dave Green and Moses in 1966, and it simply says the probability correct in a two-interval task is the area below the corresponding yes-no ROC. So this area is probability correct in a two-interval task. I mention this because we're going to generalize it. It turns out that the probability correct in a standard k plus 1 force choice task is a moment. Indeed, it's the kth moment of that random variable that is determined by the ROC and concentrated on 0, 1. Moments are important information about the distribution of a random variable. Furthermore, it can be written as the area subtended, the area below 
the dual ROC. And that result has, well, neither of these results, this one in particular, but neither of these results are, are, are well appreciated in the field. I've never seen the last one ever written down. In fact, Green and Moses would be puzzled by this because they would put k equals 1 to get the two interval data and they wouldn't understand the dual. And the reason is, as I mentioned before for future reference, the area below rho star and the area below rho is one and the same value. So Green and Moses are correct, but they might not recognize this. You can do the dual task and there you see the appearance of the original ROC. Whoa, I should mention, when rho is symmetric, the, the data from the k plus 1 fourth choice task and its dual, those data are one and the same. Now let's talk about the ranking task, which is not uh, not a common task. There are some data in the literature, but not much. The performance in the ranking task is measured as a probability that the signal receives a rank of uh, j plus 1, where j is a number either 0 or 1 through k. And there is a dual task that goes with that. The two sets of ranking data and false choice data determine one another. And there is some work that goes into showing that. The second line could have been written down as an example of, it follows from, the very famous uh, theorem of uh, Dauphinetti. It's often used as one of the cornerstones of Bayesian statistical decision making. It's very convenient to introduce the finite difference operated delta and to use that to rewrite the line just above. So given the false choice data, everything here is determined and you can reconstruct the ranking data. Likewise, the false choice data are determined from the ranking data as follows. Now let's talk about recovering the ROC when you have either the full set of false choice data. You have an infinite sequence of experiments. Why infinite? Because each experiment only gives you one number. You've got to reconstruct the whole function. So you're going to have to use your numbers uh, judiciously. One way to do that, and I've done it, is to take the false choice data, which remember are giving you moments of the random variable for signal, Vs. And you can expand the ROC rho in a series of polynomials, and Legendre polynomials are very convenient, with coefficients that are determined by the 
false choice data. Yeah. Okay. And I've done it. It, it works well, but there are, there are some issues. There is an alternative method which has never appeared in the literature, and that's very interesting. What you do is to take the ranking probabilities and define a collection of random variables indexed by uh, K whose values are on zero, one at the points one over K, two over K through one. And you can show on the basis of uh, information that it was on an earlier slide, that this sequence of random variables with the ranking probabilities determining their distribution, that sequence converges in distribution, converges in law, to the yes-no variable Vs. And once you have that, you can simply write down rho. And we can also do something similar with the noise. Uh, so for a fixed value of k, the pair vnk, vsk, provides a sing an approximation to a single point on the ROC. <coughs> and by varying k, we can collect as many points as we like. And here's just a simple example. It's the uh, a particular analytic form of rho, the distribution of the signal variable is just t squared, and it turns out that we can write down the CDF, the distribution function, for each of these uh, ranking random variables, VSK. And here's a simple numerical example. I took K equals four. This is well within uh, the ability of an experimenter. So here is values of the false alarm rate. And here are the these approximations, estimates, if you like, or predictions for values of rho, and here are the true values of rho for that example. And as you see, those approximations are quite good. With k equals 10, you would recover, you'd have 10 points but they would trace out the function rho uh, very, very well. The approximation is actually very good. And with that, um, I think I have hopefully convinced you that uh, the data from these three paradigms talk to one another in ways that had not previously been uh, fully appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting. Um, so let, let's believe this. Has anyone uh, done data collection yeah. with the three methods and then tried to recover yeah. the same properties? And the, the, the quick answer is not really. So there are some interesting memory uh, data um, from British uh, psychologists, uh, cognitive scientists, 
and essentially they are looking at the ranking task. That's one of the few sets of data that I found relevant. And th they were really interested in validating the model rather than making predictions about either yes, no, or the false choice data. And they did, a, the, the way they did their experiment was, uh, I think, fairly successful. They, well, I guess I was thinking if you, uh, you, you might get at some interesting differences in psychological processes that are being deployed by or strategies that right. people are using that could cause them to not Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If you want, these yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. If if you design an experiment poorly, you will not find this theory working very well. It it has to be. You have to. I, I would do it in psychophysics, where I'm right. I, I yeah. I, I, and. Uh, I don't know of any data that are, there, there are some data that are relevant connecting yes, no, and forced choice. But it's sort of based on estimating areas under the ROC. And you know, that's an interesting problem in itself. Uh, I mean, I had a student once uh, years ago uh, write a a computer program that was estimating an ROC under the assumption that the ROC was concave and strictly increasing. And uh, testing then is uh, another interesting statistical problem of testing under order restrictions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Take a break. Jeff will be can take questions during the break. We'll come back at eleven thirty-five.